response? I think from Elon Musk and to NASA, there's an increasing number of space agencies and organizations that are very interested in sending people to Mars. But one really important question that I don't think has been given enough attention is actually how we're going to potentially live there once we arrive. Now, there's a lot of research that's being conducted here on Earth to try and figure out some of the challenges that we're likely to face once we get there. And one of the ways that we're doing this is actually what's called analog studies, which are basically we design habitats here on Earth to try and simulate what the living conditions are going to be like on the surface of another planet. Now, one of these is the Mars Desert Research Center. And I was fortunate enough to be part of a team of people actually being based at one of these centers. And in the start of my talk today, I'll talk a little bit about the experiences that me and my team had there, as well as explain some of the other research that's being done to try and address these challenges. So where was it? Well, this is the, the Mars Desert Research Center, and it's set in the Utah desert, and it's run by the Mars Society. And it's in this incredibly iron oxide rich environment, which gives it this fantastic red color that you see here. And I think that, combined with the fact we're in such an isolated environment, really did start to give us a sense of what it would actually be like to live on the surface itself. So we've got an updated picture here. Um, this large multi-story structure that you can see, this is actually where we usually live. Uh, and we stay there for multiple weeks at a time as we started to get some indication of that. And that large dome structure is actually called the biodome, where we grow food and we look at other ways of growing large quantities, particularly of lettuce and other things, in a very small concentrated area. So, what was it like when we wanted to go outside? Well, we had to go through a full depressurization and repressurization simulation, and during which we had to wear one of these fantastic spacesuits. And everything from our parable vision to the type of gloves we wore were designed to as closely simulate as possible what it would actually be like to operate on the surface. And certainly doing fine motor control if you want to operate different bits of equipment is quite a challenge. I know from my personal experience, certainly living there, uh, and having to wear one of these suits every time you go outside. It's little things like the wind in your hair and on your face that you start to miss after a certain period of time. And certainly these little unexpected things that, that crop up. So, what was the view like? Well, this is actually the view outside one of our kitchen windows. And we got this fantastic desert backdrop. And I think, although it's incredibly beautiful, because we were essentially cut off from the world for weeks at a time, we only had a very low bandwidth satellite connection that was our link to the outside world. You really did have to rely on your teammates for that sense of sort of human companionship. So, what was the food like? Well, one of the big challenges of going to space is it's actually very expensive to get anything from here on Earth up into space. So if I had a kilogram of food with me here in Lyon, and I wanted to get it to the International Space Station, which is only about 400 kilometers above us in orbit, it would cost us around 10,000 euros to do that. Now, a large amount of food, the weight of it actually comes from water, so we're constantly looking at ways of actually dehydrating or freeze drying the food to try and get the weight down as much as possible, whilst also increasing its shelf life. And so a couple of examples, uh, freeze-dried strawberries, and then this is actually bacon and eggs. So as a British person, I felt, felt quite at home there, they were just missing the baked beans. Um, so it, it does still taste pretty similar, um, but it definitely does need a little bit more seasoning. One of the things we're starting to find by space agencies actually conducting food studies at the Mars Desert Research Center, and certainly a lot of the feedback we're getting from astronauts on board the International Space Station, is it seems like we have a psychological need for food, as well as a physical one. And certainly it seems like we need to eat a certain amount of leafy green produce in order just to maintain a sort of healthy sense of well-being. So it's quite likely that even if we can get all enough calories from here on Earth to wherever we're traveling to, we're going to need to grow some plants along the way just to keep us healthy and happy. So, what was the view like at night? Well, because we're in a basin, and the fact we're in a very isolated environment, there was basically no light pollution, and even the fact the moonlight was blocked out because of the rock features that surrounded us. 
So you basically have this crystal clear portal from where we were standing on the ground all the way up until the Milky Way, um, which you could literally just see with your naked eye um, standing outside there. I remember one particularly special moment uh, with our crewmates actually listening to the interstellar soundtrack, uh, just gazing up in our spacesuits at this incredible backdrop. And uh, it really did feel like something of a sci-fi film. And certainly something that uh, I don't think we'll forget as a team. So, we were very lucky on our team, because we also actually had a professional space photographer with us, Cassie Kloss, um, who travels the world basically taking photos of different Mars simulations that are going on. Now, she took this fantastic photo uh, at night, which basically showed the cocoon of life uh, that was our hat against the very barren backdrop of the desert. Now, typically, this is generally filled with scientists, researchers, and engineers. However, there's a large other group of scientists that are also conducting research that doesn't directly relate to us in the space sector. However, it has a large amount of application for the kind of challenges that we're going to face. And this is actually in the form of Antarctic researchers. So this is a picture of the British Antarctic Survey's Haley Research Station. And you can see here it's broken down into this modular format which basically means that if there's a problem in one particular section of the habitat, it can be isolated so it doesn't spread to the rest of it. And certainly because they're in such an isolated environment, a lot of the things that we can start to learn from people that operate here, we can also apply to the work we're doing in the space sector. One of the largest of these research stations is the Amazon Scott Research Station, which is run by the United States. Now, one of the greatest challenges of being in such a remote environment is you don't actually have access to normal medical facilities like you would on other parts of Earth. And there was a particularly unfortunate and very serious medical incident that actually took place on this station. And certainly, we in the space sector try and learn as much as possible from these types of situations to make sure they don't happen again. That was actually involving a personal hero of mine, uh, the late Dr. Jerry Fitzgerald. And during the winter months at the Antarctic Research Station, she was actually the only doctor that was still left there. Because during the winter months, they typically have what they call a skeleton crew, which is basically the bare bones needed to keep the station running. And after the last plane had left, and there was no transport going back and forth between the center and the main base, she actually realized that she had a small lump in her breast. And she didn't know what it was at first, um, but obviously, it might be the worst. And what they had to do is she had to conduct her own biopsy on herself um, because there was no other medical personnel present. But they didn't have enough equipment to actually come up with a precise diagnosis. So they're actually communicating via satellite link um, to, a, to the doctors in the United States. They arranged for a military transport craft to actually parachute and airdrop in um, both diagnosis as well as chemotherapy equipment. And she actually was able to use this equipment and train up her colleagues um, to actually, eventually, um, it did turn out she had breast cancer, but she went into remission. And I can't even begin to imagine um, what a scary situation that must have been. And it's, it's really due to the bravery of people like this uh, and the situations that occur that we can learn how to prevent these from happening again. I think there's always going to be a certain inherent risk when we're going out and really pushing the boundaries of exploration. But I think in the space sector, we have a very deep and profound responsibility to make sure we can learn as much as we can from these situations to ensure that when we do eventually make that giant leap, that we're as prepared as possible and that the people are in as safe as hands as we can get them. I think doing a manned mission to Mars would be an incredibly profound um, expedition for us to undertake as a human race. And there are a huge number of benefits of sending humans there, particularly when it comes to unlocking some of the scientific secrets that Mars holds. To give you some sense of an idea, the current best rover that we have today has a top speed of around five centimeters per second. And when Mars is furthest away from Earth, there can be up to a 44 minute communication delay between getting a signal from Mars 
to Earth and then back again. So actually having a human biologist or a human geologist actually on the surface of Mars itself, with their human intuition being able to explore the environment, it would go a huge way to actually unlocking some of the scientific secrets that Mars holds. And who knows what we may discover along the way. This is a good one.